normally I give talks with slides. Um, and I've given several this week already and I decided not to do that today because you're going to see all the information that would have been on the slides in various abstracts and, and papers and such will be coming out shortly and everybody knows what we do in each of these centers. So what I thought I'd try to do something, uh, something different, which is to talk about my perspective on this uh, set of syndromes um, based on sort of 40 years of experience in medicine and science, beginning really as a clinician, and uh, book framed, if you will, by two experiences, one in 1977 when I worked in Tishomingo, Oklahoma for the Indian Health Service, and now most recently when I'm working for the Indian government in Gorapur with unexplained encephalitis. And it's very interesting to notice that although the models have changed to some extent, the same principles apply. And those are rigorous science and history taking and physical examination because without that sort of focus, which is really I think what the clinician investigators bring to this, we're not gonna make any progress with the science. First of all, I want to congratulate everybody in this room, uh, not only the people who have the awards, but in addition, I'll solve the MECFS, because this really is, I think, an uh, extraordinary sea change for all of us. We finally have a seat at the table. Uh, we finally have attention being paid to the disease. I've been thinking about this for a very, very long time, ever since I was a neurology resident at UCSF in the 1980s, early 1980s, when Dan Peterson referred a patient to me. Uh, and at that point, as the only person who'd had medicine training as well as neurology training, I saw everybody who was thought to have an infectious disease or had something which is complicated medically. And I remember seeing that patient realizing that I had no idea what was going on and we certainly had nothing to offer. And we hope, of course, that that's now gonna change. My next uh, intersection with MECFS was through uh, the CDC. I know Vicki will remember Brian Mahi and the stories that came up in the middle 1990s when there was a suggestion that a virus that I had discovered called Born Disease Virus was the cause, in fact, of chronic fatigue syndrome. And this was very exciting at the time because the reports that had come out of Germany and Japan had suggested that 50% of people were infected with this virus. Now, many of you may not know who Brian Mahi was. He was the director of the Division of Viral and Rickettsial Diseases, and he was removed from his position because he took funds that had been allocated for CFS research and used them instead to address a pandemic risk with H5N1 in, uh, in Hong Kong, hantavirus, now known as Sinombre virus in the Four Corners, and Nipah in Malaysia. And he did this because he was unable to access any funds to do otherwise. There was no personal gain. Now we can debate whether or not he was right or wrong to do this. And there were several things that he did that were less than optimal. But the fact of the matter is we still haven't addressed these issues of public health crises nationally and internationally. So when I think in terms of the security of the funding we have here now, for MECFS, it's important to raise funds for all of NIH and all of CDC, or this particular effort would be as risk as well. Now, the next uh, exposure to MECFS, um, you know, which came through Brian, really was to look at whether or not born of disease virus could be implicated. And we spent two years trying to sort this out. And when we finally demonstrated that there was no link between born disease virus and chronic fatigue syndrome, it was almost impossible to publish the paper. It took two years to get it published, and it wound up in an unforgettable journal called the Journal of Neurovirology, which is even difficult to access online to this day. And this outlined for me that some of the difficulties that I was gonna have in the rest of my career when people ask you to debunk things, if you can, or at least to test them, because they wind up in PLOS One, and unless you're on the editorial board of a major journal, which is ultimately what I had to do with the XMRV paper, we weren't able to even get these papers 
sent out for review. In particular, when you're talking about diseases like CFS, which people have a great deal of difficulty wrapping their hands around. Nonetheless, we continue to do this with enteroviruses and ALS and MMR and, uh, and autism and so forth. And it's going to be very, very important as we do the research here to make sure that it's done rigorously and well. And I'll come back to that. There's one thing that I would say about that paper that we published in the late 1990s, which was prescient and important. As we look for immunoreactivity in these patients against Borna disease virus, we found that these patients had antibodies not only to Borna disease virus, but to a wide range of things. For the scientists among you, things like flag epitopes, proteins and markers not found in nature. So they had what appeared to be polyclonal B cell activation. So if you actually look at the last, the second to last paragraph in that paper, we say, we don't know why these people are sick. We know it's not born a disease virus, but they have immunological abnormalities. Three quarters of them had immunological abnormalities. So when people started talking about this as a psychological disease, it was clear to me that this was, you know, this er was erroneous. In 2001, as I was moving from the University of California to Columbia, um, I li literally landed, you know, sort of in the middle of 9-11. And that really changed the course of my career, initially toward emerging infections, but actually, as you ultimately see, toward chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, as you may remember, when the Twin, uh, the twin Towers fell, there was an anthrax attack that followed within the few weeks thereafter. And this led to the development of biodefense centers. Uh, I led the largest of those for approximately 11 years. This was a group, the first group I've ever led of this sort, which was enormous. It was 28 institutions in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And it's interesting, actually, that the majority of the centers we see funded during this round are from the East Coast. In fact, they're all from the sort of greater metropolitan area of New York. I don't know if anybody's noticed that or mentioned that, but I find it I find it striking. Anyway, so we pulled together people from institutions who had never worked together before. Einstein, Columbia, Cornell, NYU, uh, Rockefeller, Sinai, Yale, and others. And everybody worked together toward a common purpose. And we went from a standing start to an extraordinarily successful program. Now, during the second cycle of this war, in the last five years, this, these two reports came out, one in PNES and the other in science, about XMRV and PMLV. And there was a lot of concern about this because there were people who were promoting the use of antiretroviral therapy and thinking back on MMR and autism and measles virus and Borna and so on. Uh, this was something that was a concern to many in the medical community. So I was called by uh, Francis Collins and Harold Varmus and Tony Fauci to see whether or not we could, first of all, evaluate the work that had been done. We found that there weren't sufficient samples to do that work, which is something that I think uh, I'm very encouraged about, the idea now that there are biobanks, but to really look at whether or not these viruses could be implicated. And at that point, we gathered together a group of stellar clinicians and scientists to examine the evidence, to find ways in which we could collect um, the best specimens and so forth. And many clinicians are here in this room who participated in that. Sue Levine, Dan Peterson, Cindy Bateman, uh, Nancy Klimas, uh, and Jose Montoya, who's not here. And we found no evidence whatsoever for XMRV. And if anybody wants to watch a very interesting sort of social experiment, there's a videotape of a two-hour press conference that we had as we unveiled that particular set of results. Uh, and it's instructive to see how one can interact well or not so well with journalists and with the community. That particular corpus of people who built that study ultimately joined what was known as the Chronic Fatigue Initiative that was uh, sponsored by the Hutchins Family Foundation, where we began to tackle all sorts of interesting problems with the samples that had been gathered and you know, had accumulated, looking at the microbiome, beginning metabolomic research, 
integrating cytokines and metabolomic work and so forth. And there's a lot of very exciting work from that particular team that will be coming out shortly. I was very encouraged thinking that life had changed and for MACFS research, and I began to submit with this group a series of applications to get support from study sections at NIH to do the research that we knew needed to be done. The first report that came back from study section uh, told me that MECFS, first of all, they said CFS is a psychological illness and this is a waste of resources. The resubmission, uh, which partly in response to that, but it's very difficult to tackle that, told me that everyone with CFS had Epstein-Barr virus infection. So clearly this wasn't going to go anywhere. The third time, however, we put on our application, we got some support. So it's good we have a baseball metaphor, right? You've got three bats, you know, before they throw you out. And now with three MECFS centers, uh, we really are positioned to score. Now I'm going to say a little bit about funding. Um, I don't mean to disagree with Vicki. I think we would probably agree on much of what I'm going to say, except some things that she probably can't say publicly. So for the past three years, I've been on the advisory committee for the director of NIH. This is a very long term. People typically only serve for two years, but it requires spe special congressional approval. And there have been delays, as you know, with the current administration with getting people approved. So I've actually been on for three and will finish in, in December. And I've learned how initiatives develop, and I've also learned how they fail. Now, if you talk to directors of institutes, they will discourage earmarking. That is where you go to the director, you go to Congress, and you say, we would like special investments for this disease or that disease. Because we all believe that the best science really comes from the rank and file, from the scientists themselves who put forward investigator-initiated proposals. However, you should know that key members of Congress love earmarks. And, um, and it's important to be a squeaky wheel, but not all squeaky wheels are, you know, are, are created equally. You have to know how and when to squeak. And those of us who have some experience in this aspect of government can be helpful, I think, in, or in guiding some of that work. The NIH is facing unprecedented resource constraints, and these are becoming increasingly tight. There's an effort to seek public-private partnerships, as well as interagency partnerships, Department of Defense, USAID, as well as NIH and CDC. And this is an area where an agency like Solve MECFS could be a very important spokesperson and a very important coordinator group in building the same sorts of resilience that we see in funding for MS, Parkinson's disease, autism, and hopefully, certainly, MECFS. One of the most important issues that's arisen during the course of my career, as well as during my tenure on the board at, uh, at NIH, has been the need for rigor and reproducibility. Uh, this has really sprung largely from mouse models, where people went from preclinical findings to propose large clinical trials that cost hundreds of millions of dollars and failed, particularly with respect to ALS. So as we have basic science findings, it's important that we critique one another, that we ensure that there's replicability, that we don't overstate what we have found, and that we come up with surrogates to the best we can for these clinical trials so that we can use those funds efficiently. Otherwise, we're going to be confounded. At the center that uh, I'm pleased to be a member of, the Center for Solutions for MECFS, which sort of sounds a little bit like solve MECFS, we, 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 actually, we actually took a page from you guys, but that's OK. Imitation is flattery. Um, we deeply appreciate the support of the MECFS community. And I think every day of a young woman I met in San Francisco in 2015 named Vanessa Lee, who some of you may know, who asked me how she could help. And I said, 
we need resources. Uh, Vanessa created the crowdfunding that enabled us to do a lot of the work that we've done before she took her life uh, in February of 2015. And I'll close by answering two questions uh, that I'm getting most frequently from patients and journalists as we begin to recognize these centers and what it means. The first is, am I happy with the outcome of the RFA that was issued by Joe and, and Vicki and others? And the answer is, to some extent, like you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, I'm an impatient optimist. I think that, you know, that this is we should link, think of the glass as being more than half full. On the other hand, there was a lot of good science that was left on the table. We should have funded more centers, and the budget should have been larger. And the second is, uh, can we do something substantive with the resources that we have? And here I'm going to quote Cesar Chavez, si se puede, for those of you who don't know Spanish, it means yes, we can. Thank you very much. <laughs>